Well, so far we've been talking about uh, designs for meaning and meaning in a multimodal way. Very complicated points that we've brought up uh, and, and challenging for any educator uh, given the expectations of performance that exist inside and outside of the learning environment. But learning by design is the, one of the most important ways in which we can uh, realise uh, in any uh, reasonable way uh, the transform transformative power of uh, multimodal and multiliteracies pedagogy. Uh, one of the issues uh, with the term pedagogy uh, is that uh, it's quite often regarded as something connected with uh, schools or connected with a particular way of a particular style of instruction. And uh, if we are correct about the issue of diversity, if we are correct about the types of learners that are coming into our classroom, there's not going to be a one-size-fits-all pedagogy any more than there's going to be a one-size-fits-all you know, designs for meaning making. So we've put together here in this slide uh, four uh, approaches that are dominant in the, in the world of pedagogy. Um, uh, uh, one of them we call progressive pedagogy, uh, one of them we call traditional pedagogy, another one we've called critical pedagogy, and another one applied learning. I'm sure you're all familiar with one or more of the, these. Uh, they have uh, come into uh, the teaching uh, profession uh, quite often in dogmatic ways uh, with particular interests and particular agendas. Uh, what we want to do with this slide, though, or this uh, kind of theoretical framework that we're presenting for you around pedagogy, is to make a case for repertoires. The professional educator needs to have a repertoire. Uh, I started off with this at the very beginning, that pedagogy requires purposeful choices uh, for the discipline, for the subject, for the individual, for the classroom. And a, a teacher, uh, an educator, has to design uh, those learning experiences uh, to address those issues. So if we take the progressive pedagogy idea was always about authenticity, you know, and uh, situating uh, people in uh, experiences and from those uh, sensuous experiences, uh, understanding would come. Uh, sometimes uh, they would be what they already know. You could start off with what they bring into the classroom around a particular topic or immerse them uh, in some particular area uh, that they're not familiar with. You know, uh, go visit a pond or look at a film or immerse them in some other kind of experience. But situated practice and engage uh, uh, was one pedagogical approach uh, which involved experiences, mostly focusing on experiences. And it's an important uh, strategy to have in a repertoire. However, uh, in progressivist pedagogy, uh, sometimes educators stayed in that domain for far too long and didn't address any of the other approaches that were available uh, to them because we were told that everything had to be brought to experience. Uh, math had to be experiential, science had to be experiential, history had to be experiential. All the disciplines had to some way find a way of immersing learners in experience. So that's one approach that's available to us. Another approach is the one that we call uh, traditional pedagogy, which was essentially around direct instruction, overt instruction. And mostly it was about conceptualising uh, by naming and, of course, with theory. And we know that that's a very important pedagogical uh, approach uh, and needs to, for example, if you're immersing uh, learners in um, uh, the, the science of ponds, uh, they do need then to have the language of photosynthesis, for example, which is conceptualising around uh, what happens with sun and and plants uh, within ponds. It's not enough simply to observe and note what happens, but we need some way of naming and theorising. So it's another approach that is uh, critically important in uh, transforming learners. Uh, a third approach which has had uh, strong currency in the education uh, domain is called critical framing or critical pedagogy. Uh, and that is uh, an approach which asks uh, that 
uh, the teachers to enable learners uh, to learn why they're learning what they're learning. You know, what's the function of learning about a pond, for example? Why do you need all that abstraction? Uh, how do you... Uh, use that abstraction and that knowledge to be critical around the pond. You know, is it polluted? Uh, where does the water flow? So uh, those questions about uh, critical framing, about analysing, uh, are also uh, a very important pedagogical approach. And a fourth pedagogical approach, which we uh, call applied learning, or sometimes it's called competency-based learning, uh, is about uh, having knowledge which you apply uh, appropriately in a particular setting or creatively because you have enough uh, expertise in, in a particular area to be able to do something that's creative. Uh, like, for example, uh, uh, making a, your own pond which is uh, you know, more effective, more beautiful, more green, or whatever you might want to do in terms of uh, creativity. Now, these four approaches exist. Uh, there's a lot of uh, theory about each one of them, a lot of examples of how you do them, but no one is effective for all learners, all disciplines, all subjects and all purposes. Teachers need a repertoire. They need to move in and out to know the instructional sequence that they've selected. What's its purpose? Why is it uh, uh, important for this particular learner or this particular group or another particular subject or uh, a particular goal? Do I need to immerse somebody in some experience before I can take them into uh, conceptual learning or application? Uh, one of the criticisms about pedagogy over, over the years, and there's a battle about it, um, is that progressivist pedagogy and critical pedagogy uh, dominated uh, to the detriment, some would say, of conceptual learning and, and applied learning. Um, and then others uh, talk about traditional pedagogy uh, denying learners the ability to really understand what they're doing and focusing on memorising abstract things uh, for uh, tests, for example, and that critical framing was a barrier uh, to learning because uh, it produced uh, antagonistic stance towards knowledge. There's a huge number of debates around each one of these pedagogical approaches. For our purposes, for the purposes of learning by design, uh, what we believe all professional educators need to know is to understand uh, the uh, components of each one of these approaches, what it looks like when it's designed as a piece of instruction, how you track its effect, how you might move backwards and forwards between each one of these in order uh, to transform uh, a learner, to progress a particular uh, content area in, in an effective way uh, for all learners. Uh, so uh, the learning by design principle is agnostic to any one of these approaches as being superior to another. Uh, it is the, the purposeful choice of a teacher in collaboration with others, perhaps, but nonetheless, uh, purposeful, meaningful design of learning with the purpose of transforming and visibly seeing that transformation take place as learners progress. So I'm going to mention just a, um, a couple of other aspects of this particular uh, this framework, this learning by design framework. The first one is um, it had its roots in the New London group where we discussed four different orientations to pedagogy. We, we, we didn't want to just talk about this world of multi-literacies you know, ending up on our doorstep. We wanted to talk about what we do about it in terms of framing an appropriate pedagogy. And the four concepts that we developed there were um, situated practice, uh, avert instruction, transform practice and critical framing. framing. Now what uh, Mary and I have since done with this learning by design framework is we have given these sort of slightly less technical words but also words which can be used as labels for things that we call knowledge processes. So um, what we've got here with uh, these different, um, these four segments um, is we've changed situated practice to experiencing, uh, we changed um, overt instruction to conceptualising, uh, we change critical framing to analysing, we change transform practice to applying. These mean 
the same kind of thing. They're not quite the same, but they're, they're close enough. We wanted to have these labels to describe um, these different pedagogical orientations. Now, as Mary said, these map to the major traditions in pedagogy, to be quite frank. Um, and we've come to call these, um, in a vernacular kind of way, different things you do to know, right? So, in fact, it becomes an epistemologically based theory of learning because it's about the acts of knowing, the processes of knowing, the things you do to know. So let me just give um, a literacy um, example. Um, so situa situated practice, which becomes um, uh, experiencing, is experiencing the known. Get the students to bring in texts from their own lives and they're going to be diverse because students' diverse uh, backgrounds and interests and experiences uh, are diverse but also immerse them in new experiences, explored, exp um, expand the range of things that they know. And by the way, this was typically what progressivist literacy pedagogy um, has done. Um, then give things names. This is develop a meta-language. Build, if you like, a kind of a grammar which describes or um, the, 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 the way in which texts work. You know, in the case of a web page, this is a link, and this is a this is a user interface, and this is there's a whole lot of words to describe the design of a screen uh, in a, a website. And by the way, by the time we put those uh, terms together, a link, user interface, button, whatever these terms are, which describe general things which appear multiple times across different examples of this genre, which is called a website, we are in fact using a theory. Right? So the theory used to be about nouns and verbs and sentences and clauses and all that kind of stuff. That's what we traditionally did in literacy. Well, we need a bigger theory than that and we don't want to resolve from the fact that we do, in fact, still want theories. They just need to be broader uh, and more expansively. But also think about uh, the purposes of text functionally um, and the purposes of text critically. Functionally, what do they do? Critically, who are they for? Whose interests do they serve? And then finally, have the students make texts. The word we use is design. So they might do something appropriately. In other words, it's the first time they've done this kind of thing. So get the genre right. Or they might do something creative, which brings in bits of their own identity, uh, which um, creates a hybrid text, which uh, crosses genres, which is unique in its design, uh, designing and the designed artifact that's produced. So these become, if you like, a kind of a checklist for activity types. So at one level, um, it's a theory of knowledge, an epistemologically based theory of pedagogy where we've got this classification of different things you do to know, but in another level, it's simply a way to classify activity types and a kind of a checklist to see whether you have a variety of activity types going on. That means then the job of pedagogy is not to choose one ideological bent, one particular approach, one particular framework, but to build a repertoire uh, which is appropriate to the context, appropriate to the subject, uh, but nevertheless uh, to push that repertoire in terms of the range of um, uh, knowledge processes that the students are engaging in.